At the tail end of 2002, Death Cab for Cutie had made a name for themselves as a promising indie band on the rise. Ben Gibbard had started out the project just by himself, releasing the lo-fi demo You Can Play These Songs With Chords in 1997. He then enlisted the help of his old college friends Chris Waller on guitar and Nick Harmer on bass to turn the solo project into a full band. In this form, the band had signed to the small independent Seattle label Barzirk and steadily released the album Something About Airplanes, We Have The Facts and We're Voting Yes and The Photo Album. Each record was more successful in sales and richer in songwriting than the last. The band were also finding themselves at the centre of the cultural conversation, having notably been referenced on the popular teen drama The O.C. Do not insult Death Cab. It's like one guitar and a whole lot of complaining. But by the end of their tour in 2002 promoting the photo album, the band were tired and fractious. There were festering tensions in the band. Guitarist Chris Waller had threatened to leave Death Cab a number of times, and a series of drummers had joined and left the band in quick succession. The band collectively decided to take a break. Ben Gibbard spent time working on a new glitchy electronic side project, Postal Service, with his friend Jimmy Tamborello, and Chris Waller made a name for himself behind the mixing desk, working on albums for bands as diverse as The Thermals, Nada Surf, and Hot Hot Heat. After this short break, the band felt ready to go back into the studio to record again. At this stage, none of the band had any idea just how seminal and influential this record would go on to be. At the end of 2002, Death Cab for Cutie, together with new drummer Jason McGurr, entered the Hall of Justice studios in Seattle. The studio was an iconic recording setting, steeped in music mythology, where bands like Modest Mouse, Low and Mudhoney had all recorded much celebrated albums before them. Most notably, it was also the studio where local legends Nirvana had recorded their debut record, Bleach. Ben Gibbard presented the band with a menu of roughly 25 songs that he had written between September 2001 and November 2002. Together, the band would be encouraged to break the songs down into their constituent raw elements, sometimes stripping the songs completely back and reworking them entirely to come up with something new. Here's Chris Waller commenting on the process. We ended up doing a lot more surgery, stripping songs all the way down to the melody and the lyric, knowing that these were totally right on, and then building up around that. For me, from a producer's perspective, that was great, and it was really good for Ben too, to trust us to really tear it all apart and put it back together. In addition, the band utilised Brian Eno's famous creative device, Oblique Strategies, to spark ideas and create new innovations in their sound. Oblique Strategies is a simple series of card-based prompts. For example, one prompt in the set of cards is to work at a different speed. Taken literally, we can see how this simple instruction may have changed the song The Sound of Settling, which became one of the singles from the album. Here is the song in its original demo form, which Gibbard has said was inspired by glacial tempo slowcore bands. And now, here's the song in its final form, as it appeared on the record. Lyrically, Ben Gibbard was inspired to write about themes of long-distance romance, as he was in a relationship with someone based in the UK at the time. He wrote pensive and introspective words that explored the isolation he felt when he was away from the person he loved most, and the difficulties of maintaining romantic connection over a long distance. This idea gave rise to the title of the record itself, Transatlanticism, as in Across the Atlantic Ocean the body of water between the UK and USA. When writing the title track, Gibbard said he was inspired by seeing people saying farewell to one another at London's Heathrow Airport. He saw the heartache and sorrow that people felt when parting from their loved ones, and he wanted to bring that sense of distance into the song. To do this, the band incorporated ambient noises, 
such as the gentle hum of an aircraft engine settling down at the start of the song behind gentle piano chords to evoke this sense of distance. The song then builds into the emotive, repeated refrain of I need you so much closer, a direct and heartfelt expression of Gibbard's feelings at the time. It's a theme that is reflected in the album's acoustic final track, A Lack of Colour, as well, where Gibbard plaintively laments being separated from his lover. All the girls in every girly magazine can't make me feel any less alone. I'm reaching for the phone to call it 703. Elsewhere, Gibbard would write about the confusing torsion of romance, including the ease at which love and affection can quickly fade and die away. Here he is on the single, title and registration. Or here on Tiny Vessels, a song that Gibbard has said is about the incompatibility of two people, the letdown of romance, and the result of mistaking lust and love. There are lighter moments on the record too. On the peppy and upbeat The Sound of Settling, Gibbard would talk about how, in his mid-twenties, he was ready to settle into the maturity of old age with his love by his side. Are you this fleeting? Old age is just around the bend. And on the fan favourite Death of an Interior Decorator, Gibbard references the plot of the film Interiors by Woody Allen, a story about three adult sisters and the push and pull of their sibling rivalry at a wedding at a Long Island beach house. As a quick aside, Gibbard would later go on to use the quote, often attributed to Woody Allen, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, as the inspiration for the title of Transatlanticism's follow-up record, incidentally named Plans. All in all, this album feels like a more nuanced and textured record than anything the band had written before. It felt like an album to be listened to in one session, rather than dipped in and out of, reflecting the central theme of long distance love and heartache that ties the songs together. The record feels almost like a journey in itself, beginning with the heady excitement of the album's open, the new year, and ending with the ruminant, regretful, a lack of colour. The album was an instant hit. It attained a spot on the Billboard 100, sold a massive 225,000 units in its first year, and led to even more TV and film spots, including of course the OC, but stretching as far as the indie smash hit Garden State, and even the HBO drama series Six Feet Under. I need you so much closer The record went on to become one of the totemic records of mid noughties American indie, alongside albums by Wilco, Spoon and Animal Collective. Perhaps most importantly, the album struck at the right time. Indie guitar music was a huge cultural force at this point, and many fans rallied behind the band. 
The open vulnerability and honesty of the lyrics perhaps chimed with the country looking inwards as it grappled with the tragedies of 9-11 and Columbine just a few years previous. Just don't call the band emo. Ben Gibbard has said in past interviews he hates being referenced as emo and associated with the scene altogether. Perhaps most crucially, the album was restorative for the band members themselves. Because of the time the band were granted to spend on writing and experimentation, they were able to work more constructively, rather than being at loggerheads with one another constantly. Here's Ben Gibbard and Chris Waller talking about the album at the time it was released. Well, I just think that we're, I think that we're all at a point as a band now where we able, we're able to kind of work together in, in writing and arrangement better than we ever have before, and um, I think that's for a number of reasons, but um, I, I don't know, Chris, you should, you should hop in here and... and uh, <laughs> well, it's, uh, I don't know, I mean, as we, you know, as we, as we keep, I don't know, I guess as we keep doing this, it just, um, you know, we get to communicate better, we... We get better at listening to one another and listening to one another's ideas and like critiquing one another's ideas too. And we've gotten to a point where like if, you know, if I say to somebody in the room like I don't like that part, I don't think that's working for the song, then it doesn't turn into I hate you and I think you're a terrible person. In particular, the presence of the band's new drummer, Jason McGurr, should be singled out for helping to bring out this new collegiate attitude of the band. The introduction of new blood into the group was crucial. He eased the gears of the band, acting as a calming influence when previously tempers and disagreements would have been left to simmer and boil over. Chris Waller said at the time, It's the first record we made with Jason, and I continue to believe that Jason saved our band in a way. We were at a point where we'd been through three drummers in four years. The whole creative and power structure of the band was a dysfunctional trio before Jason came on board. It was worthwhile to continue playing music together but it was tough. Having Jason's perspective, calmness, and his energy in the band, he has a levelness and a gravity about him that we really needed at that time. One year later, propelled by the success of Transatlanticism, the band signed with Atlantic Records for a multi-album deal and left Barzirk, the little indie record label that could. Though the band is still going strong and have released many albums since, there's no denying there was something special about this period of the band's life. Transatlanticism is a document of a band firing on all cylinders, liberated and galvanised by the cultural environment off the time. What do you think of this album? Do you have a favourite track from the album and do you think it's the band's best? Comment and subscribe and let me know what you think below. Thanks for watching.